Good greetings and salutations all of you absolutely lovely individuals. And welcome back to League on Mark here and Mark here with you beauties for a lovely little silver scrapes from the LPL. Feels like it's been a minute since we got an actual game five in some of these marquee matchups. Call it the Fraud Bowl if you want. This seems like the 15th Fraud Bowl that we've had in the LPL. And it's not even going to be the last, but it is LNG versus Weibo and kicking things off in this series we got another sighting of the doge the cane in the top lane we saw keen play it uh, for gen g to wrap out the regular season but nasus in the top lane unfortunately he never really got going in this one no that dog was not picking up and nowhere close to enough stacks to be the threat that we know that the nasus snasus can always be in a situation, one that I, I will want to mention, excited about, because I think that this is going to be one that does crack through at a little point in time, whether it's going to be- Baker's been playing a mid lane, just saying. As, that's where we're going with it. Not just top lane, you got to check out the mid lane, even the GOAT, Mr. Faker himself, checking out on the Nasus. Now, is he going to be looking at this Nasus performance and saying, yeah, this is what I'm trying to sell you guys on the rest of T1? No siree, because yes, didn't get off the ground and very early it is quickly going to be that Weibo Gaming finding their angle into the series and again honestly they played super well around uh this Nasus did LNG kind of cutting him out uh or focusing him straight up how many times did we see Weiwei just immediately flash ulti the Nasus blow him up in a side lane before he's able to do anything in a team fight so the strategy worked perfectly uh, for LNG in that first game, but Weibo completely pivots in game two and says, okay, well, why don't we just go bot and get a rare Jin ahead in a game. Light gets out to like a 2K individual gold lead pretty quickly in this game. Gala at one point was two levels behind Light and not even late in the game. It was like level seven to level five. This one dive in the bot lane just got this game completely out of control. I mean, it's it's changed in recent years, but certainly one of the champions that I throw in the bottom lane tier list of top three, you don't want to be two levels behind. Now, you don't want to be two levels behind anything in this game. Let's make that clear. But if you're in the bottom lane and you're two levels behind an ADC, specifically one of these ones like Jin, the amount of bully, the type of punishment that he can dish out, that's certainly going to be there and light piloting it for Weibo Gaming. They're finding their angles, they're finding their chance, they're finding the opportunity back in to tie up the series. Which is, you know, prioritizing light is usually not a win condition uh, for Weibo. Obviously, Xiao, who eventually gets incredibly fed on Corky as well. But that was more just picking up some of the kills in a lot of these team fights. The early game was right through light on that Jin, and they kind of... Weibo just had, or not Weibo, LNG had to just run around and avoid the Jin because he was so ahead of the misfortune for Gala. Uh, Zika had the rise in that second game and it had absolutely no impact, but they decided to run it back in game three and the decisive, absolutely insane team fight around the Dragon Pit in this one, you actually get to see that top lane rise do what it can do. Maybe we're gonna see more Nasus. Maybe we're gonna see more rise in the solo lanes too. Which a shout out to the squad for sticking with it for this next game yeah. because that's clash you're telling your buddy hey no no you really had to convince the coaches yeah get get on to orn duty or something get out of here with that rise top lane action yes it does come through in the clutch does get the big time moments in that next game and it's back in the favor of lng finding that strength the number two seed of the lpl pushing them into that commanding position where it's one more and you're on to the next one it's always when the real series starts is when one squad hits match point. And obviously, uh, some of the boys on Weibo are accustomed to that because we got we got a little bit of a time machine. We're going a few years back. An absolute vintage bottle of Zhao Hu Lucian from his top lane days when ain't nobody else was playing that top lane Lucian. Or at least not to the level that Zhao Hu was. Even though he got ganked a couple of times early, he was still able to turn 1v2s into a solo kill. And time and time again, in the key team fights in this one, it was the aggressive positioning, dashing forward out of Xiaohu, that's able to seal the deal for them. 
Oh, this this is one for the fellow boomers. This is all for the old heads out there. If you've watched more than four or five years of League of Legends, this one was for you. This game for performance from Xiaohu, turning back the clock, the vintage performance individually from him, but especially that Lucian mid and the way that Xiaohu can push that as a champion. There's not a lot of guys that are able to do that or willing to do that in the mid lane. And he has done it. Mid lane, top lane, it don't matter. He's going to dial it up and he dials it up for Weibo Gaming. And it brings us to our silver scrapes. Game five, all on the line. And for LNG, what am I looking for? What am I looking for? I want a hot ticket on Gala. I need him to have some extra power in this series. He's been kind of up and down, not really factoring in as well, getting outmatched by Light in this one. Give me something. Give me the Kai'Sa. Give me... Oh, it's Ezreal coming on through once again. And let's be clear, because the Ezreal pick for Gala and Gala's performance in this series... It's okay. It, it gets a thumbs up. Is it getting the double thumbs up and being the difference maker why you're winning this game five? Unfortunately, no, it's not. Because it is Weibo Gaming and it is the story of light in the bottom lane and the story of picking Renekton Nidalee for Breathe and Tarzan and crushing it. Yeah, that's the Nidalee and Renekton actually being a highlight for this one. And listen, Tarzan, this whole series, really, especially the three wins for Weibo, was absolutely a standout. But you mentioned the Ezreal. When you pair that with Corky in the mid lane for Scout, this was absolutely a weighted out and scale comp for LNG. There was zero urgency. They, any of the fights that actually happened, there was really only, what, three real team fights in this entire game five? And... A couple of them were Hong forcing engages on the Leona, onto a Braum, onto a Renekton. LNG could never even scratch the front line of Braum Renekton uh, against Weibo in this one. Two out of three of those team fights are started by LNG with an angle or a thought to, hey, we, we've got the Braum, he's out of position, we've caught him out or whatever, let's blow him up. They try to do that most of the time, except for one of them, that they don't get the Braum at all, and they do end up giving over so much more in kills, in map position, objectives afterwards, that it does become this impossible task to take down Weibo, especially with the role light plate in this game five and the way that the damage was coming through from the ads. There was nowhere, uh, nowhere to go for Weibo Gaming pretty much, out, uh, sorry, excuse me, LNG, outside of that mid game onwards. It was just a slow doom and gloom pushed on by Weibo and the mistakes, the eagerness to jump back in and try to get their opportunity from LNG ends up biting them even more. And it is Weibo Gaming, your champions against the second seeded LNG. Second seeded seven and one regular season and they don't win a playoff series. It's a quick 0-2 and, and you're down back into the gauntlet, which of course they'll have a shot at redemption. They're still on the winner's side of that gauntlet. So it's just a single best of five they're gonna need to win to qualify for that world championship. But yeah, especially this game five, a disappointing end for LNG. It's a disappointing end, man. And it's going to end up that way no matter how you wanna really slice it up. Being the second seed from the LPL and failing to win a best of five with this, you know, guardian round extra life available to you. Never happened before. This is the first time that we have seen this come through in the LPL. So certainly now everyone thought TES was better than LNG, despite being the lower seed. We'll say that. Right. A, d d a disappointment for LNG, but not one that I think invalidates what we have seen from them this summer. And one of those ones where, okay, yes, getting two back to back best of five losses in this situation, being the favored team is not one that's going to look kindly on you but you still are not out you've got that opportunity to rebound you have to build yourself back up that's what you've at least earned yourself if you are lng looking at the strength of your summer split that's what you got to find a way to turn back into get gala back more so on these signature picks where he can really drive this team forward that's what i want to see from lng who to thunk we're in a timeline where weibo gaming is a top three squad here in the summer split. Uh, obviously going to have a good spot in regionals, even if they don't beat top esports, but overperforming what they looked like the majority of 
I mean, er, the first round of summer, absolutely, but definitely leveled up in that regular season and leveling up again here in playoffs as they ride the Tarzan train to that uh, finals or semifinals, I guess, against top esports who they're going to meet now. If you thought the LCS was top heavy, uh, case in point, Take a look at the All Pro squad. It's only team or only players from FlyQuest, Cloud9, and Team Liquid making up that first, second, third All Pro honors. And of course, the one guy who was basically unanimous, save for the votes from his own teammates who couldn't vote for him. Big Daddy Impact in the top lane, perennially a top three top laner, but it feels like it's been a while since he's been the absolute consensus top dog in the top lane and a front runner for MVP. No question it's been a while for Impact to claim this king position in the LCS. Certainly a mainstay, a well-known one, one of these top three type of guys in a lot of situations year after year. Now, claiming the number one spot without question is gotta be a great feeling for him and one of these confidence boosters for Team Liquid Squad that's rocking. Four out of the out of the five positions in that first team all pro you slide in blabber from cloud nine to that one and i think that is the right choice at this type of point i think you can either slice it up blabber or inspired who you were gonna roll with but i do favor blabber in that situation so that's why pretty happy to see blabber roll in as that first all pro then you turn your page over to the second all pro and you find your boy inspired rocking up into the jungle there yeah and with a full team C9 lineup. The theme in all these is four of one squad and some jungler gets slotted in that's not actually from there. Yeah, I think inspired uh, pretty easy second team um, and umpty obviously because, you know, Team Liquid did so well. And he's, he plays a different role than both inspired and blabber in his team. He's much more the supportive jungler than the pop-off 1v9. I'll be honest, th this is about as good as it could get from umpty. There's, there's no possible world that you were envisioning Team Liquid success and Umpty actually being even higher on this type of one. Uh, you, you, the only way, way you imagine that is if both Cloud9 and FlyQuest are abysmal and floundering and being poor, that's where you can see a world where, okay, Umpty and what he does and what his job is for Team Liquid and their success, that's where I'm gonna put it at number one. But because we have had some of these individual performances to look at with Inspired, with Blabber, you feel more comfortable saying, okay, even understanding the role and everything else, we can throw Mr. Umpty into this third team. By no means, no slouches on this third All-Pro team as well. You get Whippo in the top side, and I know polarizing guy in performances and what he's been doing, but certainly one that has had his strengths this summer split once again in the LCS. Got to be feeling good if you are the LCS looking at this All-Pro reflecting on the type of performances and the type of level of play that we have seen this year from our top level teams. And, you know, especially the growth of some of these younger players, Masu and Busio being on this list, obviously well-deserved. And then APA being first team, he already earned that most improved player award. A lot of guys were voting for his buddy in the bot lane in Yon to get that award as well. So the fact that that dual domestic carry threat for Team Liquid, it's kind of been the the two we've talked about so much for them because that was the huge level up in the spring playoffs and it's only gone up higher here in summer. It's the dream for Team Liquid already laid out that, you know, Umpty being the third all pro jungler is already pretty good given what type of role he was gonna play for Team Liquid and how things were gonna go. But when you look at that first team all pro and you're seeing APA and Yan, that's of course your young core, but they're flanked by your veteran iconic members in Impact and Core JJ as well. So it's not just that the youth has finally found its way to contribute, that you are getting this growth and emergence from APA and Yan. You're having the core mainstay, the standard that you know performing at a higher level in Impact and Core JJ and the steadiness from Umpty, Team Liquid, and the LCS were feeling good. Obviously, the main matchup you want to look at now in playoffs, seeing these all pro and even before these were announced, is Cloud9 versus FlyQuest in that 2 3 matchup, uh, still on the winner side of the bracket. And for me, I'm looking at Mr. Bwipo for this matchup because at MSI in playoff runs where FlyQuest has floundered out, 
Whippo has not been up to standard, and Thanatos has been a lane-killing, lane-dominant machine. He's played seven games of Renekton, and you feel like you still haven't really seen the picks where Thanatos is prioritized in the C9 lineup, but this matchup against Whippo might be the one where he's fully unleashed. I'm scared. I am officially scared. I don't know if Whippo is himself, but I am scared for this one because what I am seeing, what I am picturing, Whippo has his ability to pick something, you know, crazy, something wacky and make it work or something you don't see all the time or whatever pressure or matchup against some of these other top laners. But there's always a breed, a special variant of top laner that comes through that plays so dominant within that lane and on their champions that it doesn't really have an effect. And Thanatos to me is one of those type of players. And what we have already seen from him, this split with Cloud9 and what is possible to continue to grow for him, I've got to be favoring him in this matchup. Well, I mean, he was talking about all pros, second team all pro, Thanatos up against third team all pro in this sense yes i am worried about that top lane matchup because so much of the success so much of the good you know mojo that gets going gets shared around or get, gets team fights in their favor is Bwipo having that success in the top side and that is going to be absolutely under threat with not just thanatos but throw in your boy first team all pro jungler blabber making some trips up to that top side as well i'm ready to see that LCK Jace come in and teach Bwipo oh, on the game. God. Just, just, just how lethal that pick can be because sometimes we need to be reminded in North America that it actually is a pretty dang strong pick. What else is pretty strong is the not top heavy LCK, but top, top, top at the crown on the throne. It's the heaviest of all. And of course, that is the elephant in the room. Gen G going for the five peat. It, it doesn't even sound good because it's it doesn't happen. Five Pete doesn't roll off the tongue. But the question is, is it happening? You're going field or you're going Gen G in this playoff push, Mark? I I almost just want to take the field because a five Pete is just a, a ridiculous. We're talking about half a decade straight of this type of dominance at the highest of level for Gen G right now. I'm feeling I'm feeling like Gen G, where the meta is, what is possible for this team, who is operating well and why that's pushing the engine. You got to be believing in Gen G. Yes, there has never been, I think, a, a challenge to Gen G throughout this run that is as deep as this pool is for the LCK right now with where KT Rolster is, D plus Kia, Hanwha, Life, T1, any a mixture, combination, series on the day, whatever of those four, is going to be a legitimate challenger to this Gen G team. Gen G is still going to be the unanimous favorite when they step into that ring, given what we have seen from them this year. Players like Chovy and Pays continuing to accelerate, continuing to start, show their star power. The additions in Keen and Canyon proving their worth, proving the value that you saw in what they could add to this team. This is a Gen G that I am feeling will find a way to repeat nonetheless as that five-time champion it feels like t1 is the easy answer to maybe beat them if they level up we've seen competitive five game sets out of them the last time they matched up against kt the bot lane completely dismantled them don't see guma and kyria falling behind against current form deft and barrel again so Maybe T1 can level up, but yeah, I mean, the meta right now, it's still so good for Gen G. And if it gets cracked, well, guess who is probably the last guy I want to, number one, play the Nasus mid laner or somewhere else against because you're not picking up any CS against him type of situation is Chovy. And second, the last guy that I want to have a Nasus and just stack it up and deal it out on the enemy team is a guy like Chovy who can see us like insanity that we have never seen before. Gen G is a whole nother world of the excellent that we have right now. I got to be rolling with them no matter what I hear about any of the other LCK teams. Everyone trying to level up to Gen G's level in the LCK. Everyone in the LEC is trying to just level up to somewhere else because we need to see more out of all four squads left in this playoff push. I'm sensing some magic happening, number one, because 
it feels like G2, even in interviews, they're already talking about Worlds. They're already thinking about the World Championship. I'm not sure they're that invested in this playoff push and BDS. G2 is a hurdle that they have been dealing with for like a year and a half, almost two years at this point. I think there's some BDS magic getting to finals, matching up against Fnatic, where we know what happens to Fnatic in finals. It's a joke job. I, I'm all here for that. I'd love to see some of that going down. I think it, that's one of the more interesting angles that you could have for the LEC is if BDS is able to rise up to this point. Excuse me, because you've laid out before, we've had this. BDS has had this hurdle in G2. They have been one of these teams that has emerged from the rest of the pack of the LEC from the change to franchising and shown that they have have growth. They have the legs to challenge and try and establish themselves as one of these top teams. In order to do that in the LEC, you got to get by G2. You got to beat Caps. That has been the barrier for entry at this point. And BDS, unfortunately, not consistent enough with getting over that one, proving that they are capable of, of passing that type of challenge until we head to this series. And that's the one. I think the, one of the things that we have seen from them this time, last time we talked about it, was the flexibility of this roster now. It's not just Adam rolling through his gods and that's your only power pick and only power angle for this team. You're getting power from the bot lane. You're getting ice doing some damage and getting you the numbers. You're getting nuke in the mid lane, find these type of angles. This has got to be the one for BDS where I feel like you're at your very best that you've ever been to challenge and really, uh, and, and frankly, put yourself in that champion seat of the LEC. They've kind of got that nice sweet spot mix now of getting Adam picks like a Cassiopeia, something off meta, but they don't rely on it. That's a secondary thing. Sheo, still quietly and criminally maybe the most underrated player in the LEC, has clearly been a top three jungler now, going on multiple splits, has some of the best objective smite controls in the entire league, and... Ice might be the best ADC in the LEC right now. So there's absolutely angles for BDS to take down G2. Just hope all four teams are playing at a much higher level than we got last weekend in the LEC. So we feel good about Europe heading into the World Championship. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. As always, thanks for hanging out. And you know we'll catch you on that flippity flip.